Hello, my name is Dr. Amber Hughes. This is the fourth episode of my career counseling series. This is my third episode looking at the postmodern career counseling theories. In this episode, I am talking about the psychology of working. This theory was developed by Bluestein, Duffy, and their colleagues. The psychology of working differs slightly from the relational theory of working, which I know you probably haven't heard of either. <laughs> um, as their focus um, in the psychology of working is less on relationships and this newest form of the theory. Uh, however, as I talk about the evolution of the theory, I'm going to touch on the relational aspects as I believe they are important and make this theory distinct from the others. So first, a bit on the history of uh, the psychology of working. As I've mentioned, postmodern career theories arose out of a need to address a changing world of work and to be more inclusive of all workers. The psychology of working specifically considers relational influences and gendered considerations of work um, that stems from feminist theories. Godfredson first introduced feminist ideas to the field of career counseling by proposing that career development is influenced by gender and power. Feminist approaches, and as such, relational approaches, um, and now the psychology of working, have adopted a more postmodern <clears throat> social constructionist perspective, though they still focus on um, social justice that was, uh, was and is a large part of feminist um, theories. Um, through this social constructionist approach, rela relational career theories take the concept of inclusion one step further and suggests that our culture, including gender, race, socioeconomic status, and more, works to create what we know of careers. <clears throat> um, so what does this mean? It means, like with the constructionist, constructivist theories, uh, language is super important. So that theory I talked about um, before, the career construction theory, um, language is a big part of the theory. But again, it takes the use of language a bit further um, in that language is a social construction, okay? Language and knowledge is a social construction. So from this perspective, we only know what we know because of who we are, and counselors are a part of that knowledge creation. Remember that question I mentioned I used to use all the time? If you could be anything in the world, what would you be? Well, that question alone implies that you can be anything you want to be. Not unlike the good old American dream, right? Except that not everyone can be what they want to be. Some people are limited by their skills, their geography, by finances, whatever. So if I start with that question, I'm creating knowledge of careers that isn't entirely true or realistic. Um, okay, one more example. Again, about me. Um, when I first started off to college, way back when, I had intentions of getting a degree, probably going to law school and then moving back to my tiny hometown. There, I would get a job, get married, and have kids, because that's what everyone did. Only most people didn't move away to go to college to begin with. They just stayed put. Then, remember how I was learning how to kayak, learning how to um, paddle whitewater? Um, well, that all started back when I was like 19 or 20 years old. I went whitewater rafting for the first time, and I met some raft guides. They had seasonal jobs. Their view of careers and life was so different from my own that I still remember a conversation I had today with one of them. One guide said that he works in West Virginia during the summers and then works as a ski instructor during the winters. Sometimes he, sometimes he stayed in West Virginia. Some winters he went to Colorado to work. This literally blew my mind. Like I'm talking, I couldn't even grasp what he was saying. I remember saying, so you just moved to Colorado? How do you decide you're going to move? The concept of moving for work was not in my frame of reference or knowledge. It sounds silly, but that idea alone was new to me. I, I mean, I knew people who had moved away, right? I knew people who moved away and, and, and worked somewhere, but they weren't people that I had actually talked to for one because, you know, I was limited by, um, by the people I was surrounded by. Um, and the idea of just up and moving was, was beyond anything I could imagine. I mean, uh, and, uh, <laughs> admittedly the life of a raft guide is beyond what most people could imagine. I mean, he was talking about packing up um, everything in his van and driving across country, right? Um, for a couple months. So that's beyond what most people know. Um, but as someone who uh, was coming from a place of people who kept jobs for a very long time, right? So those long-term stable jobs, um, this was um, just entirely foreign to me, okay? And it opened up, what it did though, was it opened up my mind to different options of working and living. 
Um, so this one conversation uh, kind of helped create what um, it changed what I know of careers and what I know of working. Um, and, and that knowledge wouldn't have changed without that conversation. Okay. And so that's what social constructionism is saying is that we, um, what we know is, is, uh, the result of conversations and of talking and of, of language. Okay. Um, so specifically, uh, b- this theory was developed, um, to address major issues in career counseling theories that were identified first by Richardson in 93. Um, She identified a a gap between new advances in the field and integration into practice, um, which is um, pretty much what we've been talking about with um, the need for new career theories, right? Um, So so there's this need now um, for new career theories because of changes in the world of working and um, that gap that Savickist identified between, um, career theories and career counseling models. Um, Richardson is saying that essentially the same thing, um, but that career counseling at the time, especially when she wrote this in 93, um, career counseling was falling behind and we just weren't developing any new theories. Um, she also noticed that, um, traditional theories were oriented toward the white middle class, um, and specifically men, uh, and, um, and, um, were created to help people make choices, right? Like we've talked about before, make choices and to fit into jobs. The psychology of working was developed to address these issues. And in doing so, it focuses on working rather than career. And that opens up the ability to um, counsel people who, who don't have a career who, or who don't think they have a career. Maybe people who are stay-at-home moms, people who are unemployed, um, people who, again, just have to work just to work, okay? It considers career from the social constructionist perspective, which is um, considering the uh, huge power that knowledge or that language plays in um, the development of our our knowledge. Um, And it also views work from the individual's perspective, uh, not unlike the career construction um, approach by Savickas. Um, that I'm going to look to you to help you tell me what work means to you versus the more traditional approaches, which are, um, you need to come to me and I'm going to help you figure out what your interests are. And then we're going to find a job that fits your interests. Okay. So it flips, um, expertise and knowledge, um, from the counselor and puts it back on the person. Um, Now I want to talk about some of the foundational ideas of the theory, which some of them I've already mentioned, but I think they're worth repeating. Um, So foundations of the psychology of working are, first of all, that there's a shared space of relationships and uh, and work, and that the personal and and work are combined. So personal and career are, um, take place in the same place, okay, which seems um, obvious, right? But career theories and the way, you know, kind of career and mental health uh, counseling has always been set up, um, it treats it as separate, two separate things. We do career counseling and then we do mental health counseling. And while that's not uh, necessarily necessarily going to change um, because people certainly have different expertise, expertises, um, it's important to acknowledge that the two exist in the same place. And so we can't keep our career out of our personal life. If you have a bad day at work, you're going to come home and you're going to um, need to talk about it. You're going to be in a bad mood. You're going to take it out on your significant others or your pets, right? Um, but uh, it does affect us, okay? The same, the opposite is also true. If you have um, something going on at home or in your personal life, uh, you're going to go to work and you're not going to be able to pour, perform up to par, right? You're going to um, have a bad day at work. You're going to maybe shut yourself in your office if possible. Possible. Maybe you need to take a day off because things are so um, are affecting you so much. And those things. Um, so those things happen. They've always happened. But theories don't address it. And the way we approach counseling doesn't acknowledge those things. Um, and this theory seeks to um, bridge that gap between mental health and career. And, and say, yeah, they um, exist in the same place and our career impacts our mental health 
And um, so we need to acknowledge that. Um, another foundation of this theory is that social support is complex. Um, I mentioned in um, first in the uh, social cognitive career theory, social support is considered more of a either a moderator or a barrier to career development. Um, social or social constructionism and then the career construction theory all say that it's more than that. Um, the people in our lives play a large part in our development. Um, and we need to acknowledge that this um, support is complex and um, and understand what it means to the person in front of us. Um, I've had some uh, students who, um, you know, they say they want to be a doctor or a lawyer and um, you ask them, you know, why? And it's because of, I have one guy, he was um, um, in the career planning class I teach online. And he, uh, in this class, I have them write blogs. So he's writing a blog about why he wants to do what he wants to do, which I think was be a doctor. Um, and he wrote this really, really emotional, touching blog about how his mom is a single mom and she's raised him uh, by herself. And um, I think she was a nurse and always wanted to be a doctor, but she couldn't. And so he was going to be a doctor to fulfill her um her dreams. And at the end he said, and I don't think that's such a bad thing, is it? Um, no, it's not a bad thing. Of course not. He's, you know, he loves his mom and he values her. Um, and he's wanting to give her back something that she, um, she thinks she can't have now. So it, and, and that's not, you know, that's, that story is not a standalone story. We do things a lot of times for our parents or for our significant others. We make decisions, um, after we talk to people, we don't make decisions in a vacuum. We don't live in a vacuum. And so acknowledging that that social support is there and that is part of our career is important. Same thing goes for social and culture uh, of career. Um, the two things impact us. They impact what we know of career. Um, like I talked about through our, you know, the language that we, we use. Um, and they also impact how we view career and how we do career and how we make decisions about career. I've talked a lot um, about coal miners. Um, one of the issues with people who, who work in the coal industry is that um, most of them work in rural areas. Coal is mined in rural areas, right? And, and people from rural areas don't typically like to move away. They like to stay near family. They like to stay in the you know region that they grew up in. Um, like my own, you know, my own example, I thought that was what you just, I just thought that was what you did. You um, stayed in your hometown. I didn't know that people moved away. Uh, and, and that's part of the issue with coal mining is that people don't want to move away for other jobs. Um, and so we need to figure out how to bring jobs to them, jobs um, other than, than coal, uh, because that's the, you know, primary industry in the region. And then finally, knowledge is constructed through social interactions, which I've already talked about um, pretty, I think, extensively. So those are the four foundations of um, psychology of working. Um, in the most recent version of the theory, Duffy et al. Uh, identified some core assumptions. What this means is that in order for you to use this theory, you have to believe these assumptions. Kind of like with Holland's theory. Um, so his assumptions, so uh, the assumptions for that theory are that people choose their careers um, and people are happiest in careers that, are, that fit their interests. So those are just a couple of assumptions. In order for you to think that Collins' theory um, is useful, you have to believe in those assumptions. Only these assumptions for the psychology of working are different. Um, so the first assumption is that work is an essential aspect of life and, a, and an essential component of mental health. Okay. Um, this is speaking to that, um, integration of personal and career, right? That we need to work in order to be happy. Um, and if you, um, uh, Dr. Bluestein gave a good presentation once about the impact of unemployment on mental health. And it's, I mean, it's significant, right? And if it, any of you have, have lost a job or know someone who, who's lost a job, it's, um, it's no joke. And so this theory acknowledges that, um, relationship in its core assumption. No one epistemology should be privileged over another in the explication of the psych psychological nature of working. Okay. 
Uh, and so um, epistemology is like a belief system. And so this theory is essentially saying we're open to all belief systems, all open to all views of working, and one isn't necessarily better than the other. The psychological study of working should be inclusive, embracing everyone who works and who wants to work around the globe versus um, focusing on people who have choices or who are working, okay, or who have what we typically think of as career, which um, a lot of people think a career is, you know, more professional. Someone who's gone to college and gotten a job that they have a career, whereas someone who works at McDonald's doesn't have a career. Okay, this theory says, nope, everyone is included in this theory. In many cases and situations, work and non-work experiences are closely intertwined. Like I talked about that shared space of social and um, work. Work includes efforts within the marketplace as well as caregiving work, which is often not sanctioned socially and economically economically. So stay-at-home moms, stay-at-home dads, um, people who are primary caregivers for, you know, maybe a parent or um, someone else in their in their life. Um, those people who don't have um, paid jobs are still doing work and we should acknowledge that work. Working has the potential to fulfill three fundamental human needs, the, needs for, the need for survival and power, the need for social connection, and the need for self-determination. And the last assumption is to more fully understand the psychological nature of working. Careful considerations are needed of relevant social, economic, political, and historical forces, which shape, constrain, and facilitate many aspects of contemporary working. And so that's taking a step back. And this is where you really see that um, uh, kind of that history of feminist theories coming in and saying, hey, we need to consider social justice and advocacy um, as part of career counseling. That's that's basically what that's saying. And that's what um, one of the things that feminist theories do is it brings in the idea of social justice and advocacy into um, the counseling, counseling world. Um, and now I want to highlight a quote from this article, uh, the newest article describing the theory, which is Duffy, written by Duffy Bluestein, <clears throat> Deemer, and Auden in 2016. Excuse me. <clears throat> and they say uh, other theories emphasizing person environment fit and or social co cognitive approaches may be seen as complementary to the PWF or the psychology of working theory by highlighting the precise types of careers individuals chose, whether it be carpenter, mechanic or teacher, if they have relative degree freedom of choice to select among multiple options. In addition, both developmental and SCCT theories do incorporate contextual elements into their formulations and have advanced ideas that have shaped some of the key foundations for the PWF and related contributions. However, what is unique about the PWF and the theoretical contribution presented in this article is placing social and economic factors at the forefront of our conceptualizations and positioning securing decent work in general versus a specific type of career as a central outcome of the interplay between contextual, psychological, and economic factors. So what they're saying is, hey, yeah, use those other theories if your client has a choice, um, if your client has the ability to be what they want to be. Um, this theory comes in and fills gaps though. This theory comes in and fills a gap and it says we need to acknowledge that some people don't have a choice uh, and we're going to give you a framework for helping people who don't have choices. Okay. So this theory really, it, it's not saying that those things are wrong. Okay. Um, it's saying um, certainly bring in, you know, the SCCT approach, bring in, um, you know, Holland's assessment if you like that one. Uh, and use it within the psychology of working framework. Totally. Um, but you should also be considering um, social and econ economic factors that influence our career. And, and you can do so through this framework here. Um, so this theory really was developed to address issues that a whole lot of people face, but career theories didn't address. Um, one of my favorite studies, can I have a favorite study? Is that dorky? Probably. Um, anyway, this study looks at the complex ways that socioeconomic status, or SES, impacts career. So, Walpole, Walpole conducted this study in 2003. 
Um, and she looked at, uh, like I said, the way SES impacts career development and found that it impacts career development in a variety of ways. First, students from lower SES backgrounds um, may approach career development differently than other students. Um, Walpole examined the college activities and after college activities of students from low and high SES backgrounds. This included contact with faculty, time spent studying, co-curricular activities, and working. She found that students from low SES backgrounds reported spending less time in student clubs and groups and more time working. The research searcher also found that low SES students indicated spending less time studying and had lower grade point averages. Walpole also found that nine years after entering college, low SES students had lower levels of income, graduate school attendance, and educational attainment than high SES students. Okay. Um, so some of this stuff isn't surprising. Some of it is, um, you know, obvious and, and kind of highlights what we know about um, people from low SES backgrounds who go to college. Um, oftentimes they have to work to support themselves or sometimes send money back home to help, you know, help support their families. Um, they're working more. And so when you work more, you have less time for studying. Um, when you have to work, you have uh, less ability to take um, non-paid internships. Um, so that's what's one of the things that she found. Okay, so just the fact of being from a low SES means you have to work more. And that act of working impacts a lot of things. The involvement in student groups, um, clubs, and so on. Um, what I also thought was interesting is, um, so other than the obvious ways that SES um, impacts career, um, it also, to me, indicates um, how SES helps create what we know about career. Um, and so one of the things she found is that if you're from a lower SES, um, maybe like a blue collar family, um, they were more likely to take jobs that paid better right out of college um, versus uh, may, thinking more about the long term. So so that's not always the best route for the long term, that um that job right out of college or that job that pays well. Um, it might be better to take a job more relevant to your career goals that pays less now, but has potential to pay more later. It may be um, more uh, uh, useful for you to go to graduate school. Um, so if you're in a field like social work, um, it's actually going to be more, um, you're going to earn more if you get your master's degree uh, in social work, um, if you have that ability, right? Um, again, not all people do. Um, so there's a lot of ways that uh, that people could benefit from knowing more about careers. And so so it's that knowledge um, as a, a, a student or an individual from a low SES background um, has limited knowledge about world world about the world of work um, and about academics. And so that can impact um, career development as much as um, just the fact that they have to work more. Okay. Um, so obviously there's a need, uh, the need for money that impacts um, um, how SES plays a role, um, but it's also more than that. It's also the knowledge of career planning that is different as well. Um, one more concept I want to bring up from the psychology of working is that of decent work. And that was one of the things they talked about in that quote um, I just read you. Um, so the idea of decent work is a key aspect of <clears throat> the psychology of working. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, <clears throat> this one is going to sound awfully political because, um, well, some aspects of it are. And again, I'm going to point out that it's coming from, uh, a lot of this is coming from feminist theories. Um, they don't shy away from politics and social justice. Okay. Uh, so if this kind of thing is important to you, you may be drawn to this theory. Anyway, what is what is decent work? According to the International Labor Organization, decent work is characterized by four attributes. Um, concerted effort by governments and policy officials to create jobs. Um, so there's that obvious political aspect of it. So it's a concerted effort by people to create jobs. It guarantees the rights um, for workers, including but not limited to representation, freedom of association, access to collective bargaining, and other legal standards that provide human rights for workers. That um, 
nod to the unions that I um, did in that first episode uh, is speaking to this, okay? Saying that workers have the right to be represented. Um, warrants that social dialogue is sanctioned among workers, employers, and government leaders to facilitate a communitarian versus controlling world of work. And finally, seeks to ensure that women and men enjoy working conditions that are safe, allow adequate, adequate free time and rest, take into account family and social values, provide for adequate compensation in case of loss or reduced income, and permit access to adequate health care. Okay, so some of these things aren't necessarily an issue for us here in the United States. Some of them are. So some of the issues that are are being debated right now um, in our political environment, environment are the idea of a minimum wage that provides a living wage. People who work a minimum wage job right now do not make enough money to live off of. Um, talking about things like uh, um, time off for women who have kids. Um, um, that's not a requirement right now. Okay. Um, so those kinds of things, um, according to the International Labor Organization, characterize decent work. And so when not all people work in a, a place that gives them decent jobs, decent work, that should be, according to uh, this theory, that should be our priority is first to help people find decent work whatever that is. And then if they're at a place in their life or their career where they have decent jobs and that's not the issue, then we can think about choice. But our first, um, first kind of line of, of focus is to help find decent work. Um, Within the psychology of working theory, decent work consists of physical and interpersonally safe working conditions, absent of physical, mental, or emotional abuse, hours that allow for free time and adequate rest, organizational values that complement family and social values, adequate compensation, and access to adequate health care. And then, and I've kind of given some examples, but I want to give an, another example um, out of Japan, actually. Um, and I'll post the link for you if you um, are watching the video. You'll you'll see it here on the screen. Um, and the article is titled "Why America Why America Should Follow Japan's Lead on Forcing Workers to Take Vacation." Um, Oh, and I'm just going to read the article. A law forcing you to take vacation days sounds like a bureaucratic gift, but in Japan, it's meant as a workaholic in intervention. Legislation will be submitted in the country's current session of parliament that will make it to the legal, the legal responsibility of employers to ensure that workers use their holiday time. Um, and I'm going to skip a little, little bit here. Um, while it's, it may seem crazy to Americans to requ require a person to take a vacation, we suffer from more than a touch of workaholism in this country. In Japan, 22% of workers toil for more than 49 hours a week. In the U.S., it's uh, 16%. But in France and Germany, only 11% of the population puts in that many hours. Um, um, and I'm going to skip a little bit. Um, while Japan is working on decreasing unused days, America seems to be heading the other way. Use of vacation days are at their lowest point in the past four years. Fears of keeping your job, being passed over for promotions or lead projects, coming back to a staggering pile of work, or feeling like you're the only one who can do your job all push Americans to stay at the office. Um, and so, again, this legislation in Japan would force workers to to take days off. But why? Okay, so why? Um I was just reading an article about uh, lawyers and the, um, what the, uh, the article was assuming, and it, assume, I say assuming because um, the data isn't uh, necessarily going to be true. Um, people are self-reporting drug use, right? So they were looking at drug use in lawyers, um, and obviously when people are self-reporting something, it's going to be underreported. Um, but they were talking about how it's a problem, um, and likely that problem is linked to pressures on the job, uh, long work hours, um, and, and and a lack of uh, taking care of yourself, a lack of vacation. Right? That's why we take vacation is to take a break, um, and and so it's important. Like these things are not um, not 
unimportant. You know, we have, like that article was saying, we have this idea that um, you need to work hard and you need to work a lot uh, in our country. And that's not always the best thing. That's not the, always the best approach to have um, because it's bad for our mental health. It's bad for our physical health. Um, and decent work um, seeks to help us uh, maintain a balance so that we can be healthy people and, and have a, an enjoyable life that is not focused on working, you know, two, three jobs just to get by. Um, so this theory uh, kind of, I've looked at the, you know, little pieces of it. Um, and now I want to take, take a step back. And I've got here on the screen. Um, screen if you're again if you're watching the video um, a diagram of the the theory and it has become compl complex this di diagram doesn't look unlike the one from SCCT okay what I want you to pay attention to though is that the foundation of the theory are things like marginalization and economic constraints okay so this theory at its core was developed to meet the needs of a very specific population unfortunately there are a whole lot of people who would be well served by this theory and these people are in the United States. Also interesting is that the individual factors of personality are considered moderators here. If you look, if you're watching this again, you'll look down at the bottom where you see um, proactive personality and that's serving as a moderator to career adaptability, to um, marginalization, to decent work. Okay, so the goal here is to get decent work. Whereas um, if you remember from SCCT, culture was the moderator while the focus was on the individual and the individual's career choice. Okay, so career choice is not a part of this model. Um, you'll see it's almost like Maslow's hierarchy of needs in that if we meet the basic needs of survival and social connection, then we get fulfillment from our job, but not before. Okay, so we have to have decent work. We have to have social connection, survival, self-determination needs. Those have to be met before we can get fulfillment and have well-being, being. which makes total sense to me because if you're just worried about making your payments every month, you could totally care less about being happier in your job. However, if that survival need is met, then you get to be concerned about fulfillment in your job. Um, so again, a couple more comments. First, this seems obvious to a lot of us, okay? I know many of you know people or maybe your parents or your family comes from a place of having to um, just work to make um, ends meet, right? Uh, and if, if you aren't in that position, then likely you know people in your community who are, okay? Um, what is unique about this theory is that it is a theory that addresses this, okay? Again, most career theories are looking at career choice and are looking at making a choice and a decision about your careers. This theory is saying, hey, we need a theory for people who don't have a choice. We need a theory that helps us work with people who are just find, trying to find a job to get by, okay? And this theory does so. Um, so what does this theory look like in practice? Um, it looks a lot like relational cultural theory, which is um, kind of the new version of feminist theory. Uh, the psychology of working offers significant implications uh, for counseling practice, preventive initiatives, and social justice advocacy. Okay, so in practice, relational cultural theory um, is almost like, it, well, it's, it, it looks a lot like person-centered theory, which comes out of the career, not the career counseling realm, it comes out of the counseling um, world. Uh, and so you, in practice, it's not all that different from like the constructionist theory that I talked about last time, um, except it's less structured than that. Okay. So Civicus has that nice um, model of using narrative theory. Um, what, with this theory, what you're doing is using things like open-ended questions. Um, you're really going to the client to understand what's going on in their life. So there's a lot of tools out there you could use. Um, likely, you're going to be able to benefit more from qualitative assessments, um, which I'll talk about in a later episode, versus quantitative. So quantitative are like those interest inventories. Qualitative are going to be more like... Um, um, looser, open. So like open-ended questions, maybe, um, um, I use a lot of creativity when I'm doing counseling. So, uh, maybe doing like a mind map or, um, a life role circles activity. Okay. So activities like those can be helpful. 
Um, the psychology of working has the potential to identify the role of unstable constructs that can be readily incorporated into practice. Okay, so things like the economy, marginalization. Uh, in addition, by clearly measuring contextual factors within a psychological model, practitioners may be able to develop counseling interventions that help clients to frame the cause of their work struggles in a manner that is both accurate and adaptive. Okay, and so when we're bringing in the understanding of the environment and culture, um, sometimes that can help clients understand the bigger picture of work, okay, the bigger picture of what's going on in the world. So there's going to be some kind of education, uh, an educational component to it. If, obviously, if you're working with younger kids, um, you may need to consider differently um, how you're going to frame your interventions, right? You don't necessarily need to tell them that, you know, hey, you kid, you're from a low SES background, so chances are you're not going to be able to find a decent job. No, um, you don't want to do that. Um, instead, you might, uh, knowing your population, knowing, you know, for example, if you're working with a lot of students who are from a, a, a low SES background, you're going to understand the larger implications of that and be able to um, bring in interventions um, that help address some of the things that um, we see in those populations. So that's where things like research are going to help. Um, researching certain populations, knowing what the economy looks like, um, knowing um, um, how that's going to play out, and 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 um, planning your interventions to help um, maybe prevent um, what can be kind of a natural natural path. In terms of prevention, the psychology of working theory may provide empirically derived knowledge about the putative impact of psychoeducational interventions that are designed to bolster proactive personality, career adaptability, work volition, and social support. So focusing on all of those things, okay, career adaptability, work volition, social support, proactive personality. Um, which is different from like those uh, like type fit or career choice models that say, hey, you're going to take, a, um, we're going to figure out what you're interested in and then you're going to find a career that fits with your interests. Um, and it's, and, and that's what a lot of career counseling um, focuses on um, to some degree. And so this is saying maybe we need to look at other things too. Maybe we should talk about how family plays a part. Maybe we should talk about how um, what happens if you um, don't stay in a career the rest of your life, which we know is not not happening. Um, and so instead of focusing on that one thing, which is career choice, maybe we need to focus on preparing you for a lifetime of being proactive, of finding jobs, of finding work, of... Um, being able to determine what work is decent and what work is not, because a lot of times that's an issue. You know, if you think about some, some jobs and um, people just don't know, they just don't know that maybe if they're being taken advantage of, maybe, um, they're part of one of those, you know, pyramid schemes, um, and, and it's not going to work for them. Uh, and so, so that psycho ed, so that helping teach people about careers and jobs, um, is a big part of this theory. Perhaps the most critical practical aspect of the uh, psychology of working theory relates to the growing need for social advocacy within public policy arenas with respect to decent work. Um, and so in practice, we're also looking at being social advocates, um, um, if, you know, if we're buying into this theory. Um, all right, so if you haven't gotten the hint already, this is my favorite theory. I think it's the one that best fits the population I've always worked with. Does this mean you should like it? No. Um, however, I do encourage you to keep this one in your back pocket, so to speak, for those times when you're working with someone whose needs aren't being addressed by the other theories. And likely, if you're working in areas where I am, which are rural areas, um, likely uh, it, you should um, be considering some aspects of this theory whenever you're, you're doing your career counseling um, because those other theories aren't um, aren't looking at some of these things that are um, that are absolutely are things we should be considering when we work with um, populations that um, that don't have a choice in their careers.